Like a backstage pass to the world of fly fishing travel, this is Waypoints, the podcast of Destination Angling. News and events, helpful travel tips, destination profiles, great stories, and expert advice from some of the most seasoned and experienced names in fishing travel. Waypoints is brought to you by Yellow Dog Fly Fishing Adventures, the industry's number one specialty travel company for the very best insider knowledge, logistical support, and trip preparation. Freshwater or saltwater, international or domestic, Yellow Dog has you covered for your next fishing adventure. And now, your Waypoints host, Yellow Dog founder and director, Jim Klug. Montana's Madison River is arguably the most iconic river in the U.S. West, certainly when it comes to fly fishing and fly fishing history. More than 140 miles long, the Madison begins in Yellowstone National Park at the confluence of the Firehole and Gibbon Rivers. It then winds and flows its way through canyons, forests, open plains, and exceptionally beautiful landscapes before reaching the Missouri River near the town of Three Forks, Montana. With its stunning scenery and excellent fishing, a visit to the Madison River is a top priority for anglers from all over the world. Our guest today is Joe Dillschneider, a true disciple of the Madison. Raised in a family of Midwestern sportsmen, Joe grew up fly fishing the warm waters of southern Missouri and Arkansas, where he first developed his love for the sport. As a teenager, he traveled west with his father in search of trout and discovered what would become his lifelong calling. Joe officially began his Montana guide career in the early 90s and moved to Ennis, Montana in 1995. In 2005, Joe expanded his fishing resume to include shop owner, and today, Joe owns Ennis-based Madison River Fishing Company and Trout Stalkers Fly Shop, two of the very best retail operations in the game. Joe and his wife, Ricky, who he met while guiding Montana's Smith River, still live in the small town of Ennis with their two beautiful daughters and a rotating cast of fishing dogs. As a licensed Montana outfitter, he's spent more than 30 years guiding on the Madison, and few know and love this river as much as Joe. Joe, thanks so much for being here with us today. Right on, Jim. Thanks for having me. I'm glad we uh, we finally got a chance to sit down and, and talk about the Madison, and it's a timely conversation. A lot going on, and, and man, what is going on with the Madison these days? There's all kinds of things in the news. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, not all of it's real positive news, but... Um Things are generally pretty good there, I'd, I'd have to say. Good. And the, the small town of Ennis, it's not exploding like the rest of Montana quite yet? Well, you know, it. Uh, I'd say it looks like the Great Depression compared to Bozeman and Big Sky, but uh, we are seeing some some growth and some uh, influx of new people. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's still uh, Trout Town, USA, for sure, and I'm, I'm sure a great place to call home and raise your family. Oh, I love it. Yep. Well, to kick things off, I, I just want to review a little bit about the, the makeup of the river itself, and then we're going to launch into some issues and some updates and some recent news. But let's talk a little bit about the Madison. It, it uh, begins in Yellowstone National Park, where it runs for 23 miles before leaving the park near West Yellowstone. Yep. It uh, then runs into Hebgen Reservoir, which is about a 14-mile-long lake created by the infamous Hebgen Dam. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And then below Hebgen, the river runs into another dam, but this one's different that it was naturally caused. Yes, Quake Lake. Uh, fascinating history there and uh, a real significant factor in the whole you know, scheme of that uh, drainage. Yeah, and in, in 59, the area was hit by a massive earthquake that basically brought down a mountain, completely blocked the Madison at the west end of Madison Canyon, gave us Quake Lake, and then below that gave us the infamous slide, which is a pretty gnarly piece of water for a couple miles there. Yep, yep. And uh, beneath the whitewater section, that's when things get pretty iconic. I mean, that's where you begin that, that kind of 50 mile riffle where for the next 53 miles, it winds its way through the Madison Valley down through Ennis and, uh, probably one of the most well-known and well-loved pieces of trout water anywhere in the world. Absolutely. Uh, most, most people refer to that reach between Quake Lake and Ennis Lake as the upper Madison. Uh, when you read stories about it or you hear people talking about it locally or elsewhere, they talk about the Upper Madison. That's what they're referring to, which is a bit of a misnomer um, based on what you just described. You know, the, the river begins in Yellowstone Park. So I would 
technically call that the upper Madison and uh, that reach between Quake and Ennis is more of the middle reach of the Madison but just to just to make that clear for those who aren't really familiar with it and and this is a section that I mean full of riffles and runs and pools you know just that nice riffly water for about 50 plus miles and you know a lot of people would say it's some of the best fishing on the river but it's certainly the most popular section for anglers yeah, I believe that's true. Yeah, and then after passing through Ennis, the Madison flows into Ennis Lake um, through another dam, the Madison Dam, and then into uh, the infamous Bear Trap Canyon. And this is a seven-mile canyon that's boxed in by towering canyon walls, features a lot of really spicy whitewater. Um, not a lot of boat traffic in there other than whitewater enthusiasts and kayakers, but yep. uh, great yep. fishing. That kitchen sink rapid is uh, formidable, and uh, more than a few people have lost their lives in there. So that that makes that stretch of the river pretty prohibitive. Yeah, it's it's a gnarly piece of water. The closest I've ever come to drowning in my entire life was in the kitchen sink, and okay. uh, yeah, it's I mean it's it's legit. Mm -hmm. It's not for the uh, you know. Uh, casual recreational rower for sure no. but uh it emerges from the bear trap about seven miles uh below the dam and then it flows for 31 more miles to the confluence of the missouri and that makes up your your 140 miles of, of the madison a lot of different types of water a lot of different characteristics a lot of different kinds of scenery uh but really great fishing kind of throughout yep yep different fishing yeah absolutely no it's 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 infested with trout for all 140 miles. So it's, it's an amazing river. Well, you know, we have trout water all over the place here in Montana. We're surrounded by great rivers, right? All filled with trout, pretty amazing fishing wherever you want to look. But what is it about the Madison, Joe, in, in your opinion, that makes it so unique and so special? Gosh, uh, so many things. It's a hard question to answer, but a few, a few things that, you know, are to me pretty evident, um, Number one, it is infested with trout. It's due to the the nature of the drainage, the 50 mile riffle, as you mentioned. Um, it's extremely rich in in bug life. Um, it's shallow. It's swift. It's highly oxygenated. So um, photosynthesis and all the dissolved nutrients within that watershed create a very very um, you know biologically rich environment. So the fishery itself is is tremendous for a freestone river. Now, technically it's a tailwater with the Hebgen Dam, but it doesn't exactly act like a bottom draw tailwater like the Missouri or the San Juan or the Green River. Um, it, it tends to tends to have more characteristics of a freestone. So if you if you look at it from that perspective, the fish population is is just amazing at between two to like six thousand catchable sized trout per mile. So there's that. Um, you know, it's it's a productive place, but it's also uh, as you mentioned, it's stunningly beautiful. It's sort of classic big sky country, big open, wide open valley with towering, you know, 10, 11,000 foot peaks all around you. Um, those those things really create a special type environment. And the fishing is is different than a lot of other uh, rivers. It's it's swift, it's fast, it's nonstop, it's quick action. Uh, there's, there's, there's no real um, slow kind of water you know it's it keeps you engaged and and it's um you know we're going to talk about access in general in a little bit here but as far as a a, a river for anglers i mean it's pretty accessible it's pretty weightable it's pretty floatable in that 50 mile riffle there's nothing in that section at least that's really going to hurt you too bad and uh you know it, it takes a lot of anglers every year but it, it keeps on giving back that's the amazing thing about the madison it is seriously resilient um it gives not only every year, but every day. I mean, it's amazing the pressure that it withstands and continues to produce and the fishery remains in, in good health. Um, yeah, because as you mentioned, it is super accessible. It's almost, it's almost the perfect kind of floating drift boat river, size-wise accessibility. The, the distance between the different access points sets up really well for you know, all, all sorts of float trips, half days, full days, overnights, whatever. Well, you know, for years, the Madison has kind of been the river in Montana. You know, people are going to come from all over the world to make their fishing pilgrimage to Montana. 
And the Madison's always on that list. I mean, it is, you know, I've, I've used the word iconic with the Madison, but it is. And, you know, what is it that, that just draws people from all over the world? Why do they have to start that list with the Madison? I mean, we've got the Yellowstone, we've got the Beaverhead. I mean, the list is long, right? You got the Ruby, you know, you just, it goes on and on in Montana, a ton of water, but the Madison is always on everyone's list that they've got to check off as an angler. Yeah. Well, um, there's something about the name that's appealing. Um, it's named after James Madison. Um, but I think, I think as much as anything, it's, it's the fishery probably at, at its core. It's actually pretty forgiving as a fishery. When the bite is on in that river, you don't have to be a super technical, a highly skilled angler to do really well. Now, if you have great skills and you are a, you know, experienced technical angler, you can probably do ex exceptionally well, but, um, it's it's forgiving so it's very approachable it's it's doable for for everyone and you know the fish are nice size and you mix into that the swiftness of the current and everything and and it's exciting i mean you get a you get a good size 18 or 20 inch trout and you've got your hands full in that river so um it it just like i said it's very engaging captivating achievable attainable beautiful um it's got something all for the, everybody. All those things, yeah. Yeah, and you can catch fish on every conceivable tactic. It all works uh, at one time or another, if not all the time. You know, So you can sort of choose your poison, dry fly, nymph, streamer, whatever you're into. I love that about the Madison, no doubt. Um, and, you know, it, it's been on the radar for, for angling, I mean, not just over the last decade or two, but, I mean, since the 40s and 50s, people have been making the trip out to Montana to fish the Madison. Yeah. A lot of history. Yeah, no question. And it, it just, it's had a few big growth spurts, as in, in, to the best of my knowledge, in the early days there in the 40s and 50s coming out of World War II, and I think people first really started to recreate and travel more and more, and you know, prosperity came back to America. That was the beginning. But in the 80s and uh, the early 90s, uh, it had another big sort of growth in popularity along with um, a river runs through it, which was a big impact on our whole industry at the time. And then, of course, here in the last sort of maybe – 10 years or so we've seen kind of another uptick in popularity there well and and then we have the uh the aftermath of covid uh and we're you know over the last two years during covid and the pandemic a lot of people got in their car and drove west and so um i think really we're just at the beginning of another spike in, in a lot of ways as far as people that are you know have either found their way to fly fishing for the first time or a lot of lapsed anglers that maybe did it when they were younger but now they're coming back into the sport they rediscovered it and of course they're all coming to montana to fish absolutely yep. well and you know I want to talk today about some of the issues that are faced in the Madison. Um, I mean, there's a lot of great things that are going on with the river and there's a lot of challenges that, that uh, the river is dealing with right now uh, as, as well as, you know, sportsmen, anglers, outfitters, guides, a lot in the news about the Madison lately. Um, I want to start uh, off talking about the November 30th incident on the Hebgen dam. And there was a malfunction uh, at the Hebgen dam. It caused the Madison to drop uh, overnight, alarmingly low it flows dropped to around 177 cubic feet per second. And it left uh, some good chunks of that that kind of upper section right below uh, Madison and, and, and Quake. Um, not quite dry, but pretty darn low. Um, talk to us a little bit about what the heck happened with, with that whole incident. Yeah, um, that, was, that was really unfortunate. So my understanding is shortly after midnight on November 30th, a big piece of steel somehow broke at the at the gate that controls the outflow of Hebgen Lake into the river. And basically in about two seconds, it caused a 70% reduction in the flow rate out of the Hebgen Dam. So um, the river immediately downstream, the stretch between Hebgen and Quake Lake was dewatered very rapidly. It wasn't until the following, uh, that morning, the morning of the 30th, I was at uh, work at the fishing company and I got a text from my good friend up in West Yellowstone, Joe Moore, saying, what's up with this? With a link to the Hebgen uh, Dam USGS gauge showing the precipitous drop. I looked at it and said, whoa, what is up with that? So we talked about it in the shop and we called Northwestern Energy, who manages the dam there. And oh, we have a contact there, their PR guy, asked him what was going on. He actually told us he thought it was a uh, gauge malfunction and um, that that was 
there was nothing wrong with the dam. It was just simply some sort of uh, computer or gauge malfunction that was displaying wrong on the uh, USGS. So everything website. he thought everything was fine. It was just yes. a, a that was tech a, glitch. That on was the about ten thirty or eleven o'clock that morning. A couple minutes later, I got a text photograph from another guide buddy of the river up there, and it was alarming. And so we called the guy back, and we said, "No, this is for real." And and he said, "Well, I'm gonna have to call you back." So upshot is they and the concerning. Part of this, for me anyway, and puzzling, is that they didn't have any kind of early detection or warning system that this had happened. It came to their attention because of a couple astute fishing guides. Uh, John McClure and Joe Moore were the ones who first picked up on it and notified everyone. And it pretty much became a code blue situation at that moment. And after thinking about it for just a little bit, I was like, well, hell, I'm, I just jumped in my truck and drove up there. Because I, I wanted to see for, for myself what was going on and see the river all the way up. And uh, it was fine. Everything looked fine, of course, until I got up there uh, right on the highway between Hebgen Dam and uh, the Campfire Lodge. And, of course, I was horrified at what I saw. So I ran down there. There was nobody else there. Um, this is about two in the afternoon and within and i'm taking photos and video and walking around and seeing fish stranded and seeing fish uh pulled up in puddles and a few of them actually dead and dried up on the ground <clears throat> and at that point a few other uh fishing guides i know from other shops showed up and they had buckets and nets they were a little more prepared than i was i just kind of flew off and drove up there um but there was about four of us that congregated there until dark and ran around into every puddle and we scooped up hundreds of fish and big ones i mean a ton of like 20 plus inch trout that were caught in a couple pools and put them back in the main current but it did feel sort of futile at the time so that night um of course this went out on the airwaves quickly all over the world and uh, people put together um, a lot of plans to show up and rally up the next morning and go with buckets and nets and try and save as many fish as possible. So that's what we did. Saw a couple of uh, yellow dog people there um, the following morning. And, and the, I guess if you could pick out one positive that happened in all of it, it was that. There was a real uh, a rally around it and, and a virtual army of people showed up to go rescue fish. So... To keep it kind of brief, the, the net result was it turns out that the river dropped extremely quickly below Hebgen, and the majority of the damage was probably done there between Hebgen and Quake. But the Quake Lake sort of buffering effect of that flow caused the flow to drop much slower from Quake Lake downstream. So when we were investigating the channels around Pine Butte and the West Fork the following day for stranded fish, we weren't finding near the numbers that we were finding the afternoon before. Turns out it looks like they dropped slow enough. A lot of them were able to swim out of those side channels. There were quite a few um, reds and some of the better spawning channels that were left high and dry. So there, there may be lasting damage there. But by the time you got down to the West Fork and below Lions Bridge, all the way down to Ennis, uh, the flow declined pretty slowly, and most of the reds in the side channels remained wet for the 48 hours that the the dam was broken. So they fixed it after 48 hours, and my layman's sort of view of things and, and experience with it all is that um, if there was some serious damage done to the fishery resource, it was probably mostly above West Fork. It, it appeared as though it never got, you know, just catastrophically low below Ennis, which was another big area of concern. So hopefully the damage was somewhat limited. And, uh, you know, there's people, you know, calling for some investigations and accountability and all that now, of course. Um, but what's done is done. And we won't really know the true extent of it for a couple of years until you can look at the fisheries data two years from now. Um, yeah, because, I mean, you think about all those reds that were exposed. I mean, that's an entire year class of new trout, right? Yeah. Or in this case, not. Yes. Um, so, yeah, it's going to take a couple of years for that to sort itself out. Um, and, and, you know, you it is pretty tragic that this happened. I mean, Northwest Energy, I mean, what's their response been? I mean, are, are people um, still outraged? Are they pointing a lot of fingers? I mean, has there been any... Um, effort on their part to say, okay, here's what happened. Here's how we're going to prevent this from happening again in the future. We're on top of this. I haven't heard exactly that. Um, I will say Northwestern Energy has a very polished and on the ball PR department. They were they were quickly responsive and you know definitely let people know that they were 
working on it and, and doing things. So, um, they, they know how to respond to crisis. Um, I don't know what that means going forward in the future. Um, I don't know what sort of liability or accountability they have, if any, with this or, or they should, they, they do operate within the kind confines of a license issued by the federal energy regulatory committee. And they may have violated some of the parameters of that. What the, what the repercussions are, I have no idea. Um, but you gotta remember this is 13 years after the last big I was malfunction just going to say, this dam. is not the first issue they've had with that dam. No, it's not. That ha In 2008, there was a malfunction that caused, you know, a lot more water to flow through than, than should have, which was, in hindsight, a better problem. Um, but it's it's sort of, it's just an unfortunate, I, I look at it as just an unfortunate thing. It was nobody's, I mean, you could maybe say someone wasn't checking that close enough or I don't know what, but it was a, it was a technical malfunction and nobody intended for this to happen. And in reality, you asked about what makes the Madison great. The Hebgen dam is one of the things that makes the Madison great for better or worse. Um, it, it, regulates the flow. So we don't see near the extremes on the high end or the low end that, for example, the big hole, the Jefferson, the, the Yellowstone, Yellowstone do. Yeah. yeah. And that's part of what creates a, you know, large and stable population of trout. So, and consistent fishing. I mean, when, yes. when the rest of the rivers are blowing out around here in May and early June, the upper Madison is fishing. There's no doubt about exactly. it. Exactly. Well, you talked about the silver lining, and, and I got to say, I was blown away by the turnout and the immediate mobilization of so many people that care about the river. I mean, guides, all the retailers, you know, just river users, recreationists, certainly, you know, individual anglers, everybody turned out that following day. Trucks bringing people down, everybody's waited up, buckets, nets, people are there to help. And there were hundreds of people that showed up. You know, you guys, Madison River Fishing Company and Trout Stalkers, Kelly Gallup's crew, Joe and, and Heems and the guys from Big Sky Anglers, you know, all the retailers and, and the outfitters in the area, I mean, we're on it. And, and it was really cool to see the entire industry and the entire kind of user base and of, of river lovers mobilize almost immediately to, to say, hey, what can we do to help? Yeah. You know, this is, a, this is a big damn issue. It, it is, you know, Northwestern Energy has got to deal with this, but we're here on the ground right now. And if I'm walking side channels and trying to scoop up fish or rescuing sculpins or whatever I can do, um, you know, let's make it happen. It was amazing to see that. Uh, and the turnout, you know, it just shows you how many people love this river. Yeah. And, you know, the usual suspects were there, of course, but also what, what was impressive for me is to see the number of people that were just, you know, John Q. public that love the Madison, many of whom drove from far and wide. We had people come from Idaho Falls to come up there and help. So yeah, I saw a news segment with a guy who drove down with his son from Kalispell. Yeah. I mean, heard, heard about the news, got in the truck and came. Yeah. So that's maybe, I mean, if you're, if you're, if you're thinking of crowding and stuff, that's the, that's the flip side and that's the good side. The more people that love this sport and love these resources, you know, the, the more we can help protect them. You got stakeholders. Yeah. yeah. And, what, and uh, so many fisheries are, are under pressure today. So that's, that's the, that's the upside to, I guess, more, you know, more people doing what we love is hopefully there's more people that are conservation minded about it. And, you know, we're going to vote with that in mind and, and be consumers with that in mind and, you know, help make the world a better place. Well, I know that you, you and your family have a new year's day tradition where every year you get up early and you guys go and you, you float and fish the Madison. Um, so you've obviously hit a, a number of these sections since the November 30th incident. What do you find and what are you seeing? Well, only once. I've only fished once since then. And it was new year's day for the 23rd new year's day in a row. And, uh, it was Wicked cold, if you'll recall. It was 14 below in Ennis that morning when we left the house. Your, your daughters must love this tradition. You know, they actually do. <laughs> uh, they love it and hate it, but uh, they do love it, and I, I make them go. Um, and it's not the first time we've been out there at 5 or 10 below. It, it's pretty common. But So we went to $3 Bridge and walked in. And it was beautiful. Uh, the river was beautiful. I don't know what the flow was. I think it's right around 1,000 CFS. But nobody's up there, of course, at that time of year. And most of the rest of the river is covered in ice and anchor ice. But if you get up there, uh, the first 10 miles below Quake Lake, it's flowing low and clear and beautiful. And um, the fish bite really well. So we, we waded in and we caught a few nice ones relatively easily right there under the bridge. And basically declared victory and went home and had some hot cocoa. Um, 
So just from that little anecdotal experience, the river's in great shape. I mean, these were uh, all rainbows. I think we landed three rainbows, and they were all beautiful, looked in healthy, great shape, and nice size. So um, I'm I'm optimistic that in spite of this dam incident, um, the river's going to continue to fish well. It has proven itself resilient time and time again. And, uh, you know, there's there's a healthy population of fish in there and we, we may have lost some, we definitely did, but, uh, I don't think it's, I don't think it was disastrous by any means. Well, that, I mean, that is the, uh, you know, kind of the description of the Madison as resilient. It always has been. And, Mm -hmm. and, you know, that brings up the, the second topic I want to talk about. I know you've been heavily involved in this issue, um, for many years. And and that is the issue of crowding on the Madison. And it has really been a hot topic here in Montana. Um, It's something that's in the paper all the time. Um, For years, they've been working on ways that they can, you know, identify the problems and then regulate user days and and try to do something about the crowds, whether it's reducing the crowds or dispersing the crowds, you know, resting and rotating pieces of water. Um, You've been involved in these efforts to to address the the crowding and and find some possible solutions. And correct me if I'm wrong, but these efforts have largely been spearheaded by Montana Fish and Wildlife, Fish, Wildlife and Parks, their, their Fish and Wildlife Commission. Is that right? Yes. And it seems like you know, to me, and again, I, I pay attention to this. I live here. You know, I care about the Madison. But even someone who who is paying attention, you know, it seems like the the commission has constantly been adopting, repealing, amending rules, and kind of on a regular basis. And when someone calls me on the phone and says, "Well, tell me what's going on with you know potential new regulations on the Madison, you know, with the uh, the crowding issue, what's being done about it?" It's kind of hard to answer that question from from my standpoint. Can you explain kind of? what's been going on and, and where things currently stand? Sure. Well, the current effort to develop a recreation management plan on the Madison River, the upper and the lower, goes back quite a long way. Um, in fact, if you go really far back, and Dave Cumline here in Bozeman can speak to this probably better than anyone, but in the 80s, in like 1980, there was actually a moratorium on outfitters placed there. And there was sort of the first effort to kind of deal with crowding, which is sort of funny now to think about it, what they considered crowding in 1980 compared to where we are now. But that... <clears throat> didn't last long the moratorium was repealed and another 20 plus almost 30 years went by so then um in 2011 2012 is when um fwp first got more serious again and organized and developed a citizens advisory committee to help develop a set of recommendations around recreation management commercial and non-commercial i i was a i was a member of that committee and it was a variety of different kind of stakeholders as some business people just some private anglers um a, a yeah. kind of a mix yeah they there it was 12 people i believe at that time and that's sort of a normal size for these things but yes they go to great lengths to make sure they have the different stakeholder groups represented and of course outfitters like myself are a big one so are people People that work within the agencies, BLM and FWP, and then there's just public anglers and uh, water users and so on and so forth. But we made some recommendations to the commission, um, some of which were accepted, but the bottom line is nothing really happened. None of them were ever implemented, um, partially because at that time there was there were some funding problems within the department and other reasons. So upshot was that one went nowhere so then in 2018 they kind of started it up again cranked it up again and put together the second committee the negotiated rulemaking committee the nrc i was not part of that one um even though i applied to be i was not selected and i did attend every meeting um and that one was pretty controversial because more people got involved in it and more organizations got involved in it and that one basically resulted in uh, no action, no recommendation, and that committee disbanding, um, sort of in a, a a blow up, if you will. Although it wasn't really a very um, dramatic blow up, so more of an implosion. <clears throat> yeah, it, it pretty much imploded, um, which some people were happy about and some people were upset about. Um, and then you move forward again and to. Uh, At the end, actually, let me back up. At the end of that uh, period with the negotiated rulemaking committee, the uh, commission did adopt some new rules for 
the recreation management plan that we're set to go into effect right now, January 2022 and later this spring. Uh, number one was capping commercial use at either the highest of 2019 or 2020 levels. Mm -hmm. The other one that was big was a rest and rotation plan, which mostly related to the stretch between Quake Lake and Lions Bridge, the walk wade stretch, which is like the high church of fly fishing up there around three dollar and um and that commission uh passed those things into rule and shortly thereafter um the sort of political leadership within montana changed and therefore so did several of the commission members and um but they didn't really get to the heart of the matter and address the whole issue the the whole enchilada so fwp um put together uh, a working group, which is the third committee, which has uh, been organized and is working on this problem right now. That was also mandated through, through that 2019 commission. So now we have the Madison Working Group, it's called. And they recently recommended to the, ex the new existing uh, fishing game commissioners that they repeal that walkway rule. Um, it was fairly controversial. It would have allowed a couple days of boats floating and fishing from Reynolds Pass down to Lyons, which has not been allowed since the 1980s. And many people um, consider that a sacrilege. So there was a lot of emotion around it. Um, not a whole bunch of widespread support. So the commission took that recommendation and indeed just repealed that. So that will not be going into it. never went into effect. It was supposed to go into effect this May. So that's I hope that was clear. Um, that's where we are. The walkway stretches on the Madison remain, uh, the regulations remain status quo as they have been for 30 years. Meanwhile, this working group is tasked with, once again, developing broad overreaching recreation management plans that will be passed to the commission to review and either accept, modify, or adopt, or what have you. And these are the hard questions. How do you how do you deal with capping commercial use and then allocating that within the existing group of commercial users and allowing a path to entry for the youngsters that are coming up through the through the ranks or aren't even here yet? And then the second big question, and by far, in my opinion, the hardest one is how do you deal with non-commercial or public use on the river, which is growing like mad. Um, yeah. It's the, definitely the largest growth segment. It turns out there's a, there's a few people moving to Montana these days. Yeah. Well, I, you know, and you bring up a point about the commercial use, <clears throat> and I'm sure just talking about this, I'll probably get some angry emails, right? But, you know, that is kind of the low hanging fruit, right? That's easily identified. And so, you, you know, you know what the commercial use is, you know, how many user days, you know, who's doing what exactly. But at the end of the day, on a, a crowded, popular, heavily visited resource, commercial use, I've heard everywhere from like maybe 7% to 12%, but it's not a huge chunk. It's not, you know, half of the people on the river are there on guide trips or not outfitters. It's still a relatively small number. Now it's a, it's a easy target again, because it's identifiable, but let's say you go in and you regulate the hell out of that doesn't solve the problem. Right. I mean, there's still a massive number of users, recreationalists, anglers that are not commercial. They have no affiliation with commercial. And so how do you begin to tackle that issue? Because, I mean, you can do whatever you want with that seven to 12%, but that's not going to fix the problem. Yeah. Um, and I think it was in 2019, this is the department's data. I think the commercial was around 14%. Um, but whatever. Um, I agree with you. That's, that's only a small piece of the uh, thing, but there are times and places on the upper Madison when no question you're going to see 80 or 90 percent of the users are going to be guides. Um, so that that data is hard to get your head around and really nobody really believes it, I guess, even though it's it's hard data. Um, so so I think it's you've got to take a holistic approach and the commercial users are certainly, you know, we're, for the most part, support regulation. In fact, most of my peers believe, like I do, this should have been dealt with and done 20 years ago. Um, it's unfortunate that it wasn't, but here we are now. We shouldn't wait another 20 years. Uh, the non-commercial side is much more challenging. There are some models around the country in Oregon and in Michigan where, you know, for better or worse, they have come up with systems like this to manage non-commercial use 
The Madison's sort of unique, though. It's a day-use river primarily, and you know, not everyone is going to be able to plan far in advance the days they want to go fishing. I mean, if you and your family have a Sunday free, you're not going to, well, we should have applied three months ago for our permit for this Sunday. <laughs> you know, that doesn't work. So it's a complicated and difficult problem, and I don't envy those guys who are uh, dealing with it, but I know some of the people on the working group and who are extremely... Um, dedicated to it and uh, academically oriented or studying it and I'm I'm hopeful they're gonna they're gonna come up with something workable um, because unlimited growth like we've seen and like we've got happening is 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 not good it's unsustainable uh, I think Jim Harrison said unlimited growth is the motto of the cancer cell so now well, there you have it but you know you, you bring up a, a point about um, outfitters and guides uh, commercial entities on the river you know, you guys are trying to provide an experience for people that maybe are coming from out of state or within state that, you know, are paying you money to go down and enjoy a day on the river. And, you know, I, I think oftentimes it's it's lost, especially when you're trying to kind of, you know, quantify, you know, who's who's the abuser here? You know, who uh, who can we go after? Who can we identify that's, you know, putting way too much pressure on this? Well, it must be the, the guides and outfitters. But, you know, as you said, most of the commercial entities are in favor of regulation because you guys have an experience you want to provide. You don't want to see that experience continue to degrade, you know, to the point where, you know, why, why would anyone come out and do it? So, it, you know, it, it is in everyone's best interest to, to find a workable solution so that, you know, when somebody pays money to come out and float the Madison and experience this part of Montana, it is a great experience. You know, it doesn't, you know, you don't want bumper boats in an ur urban type setting. I mean, no one wants to to pay for that or experience it. It's not good, you know, for the for the business of fly fishing, for the sport of fly fishing. And certainly that type of, of pressure is, is, it goes without saying, is not good for the resource. So yep. it's, it's uh, you know, a lot of different um, stakeholders involved here. And it's not just, you know, those that are getting paid to take anglers versus, you know, against those that aren't and just want to use it on their own. I mean, there's a lot of factors at work here. No question. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a double-edged sword. Um, and there are times, you know, when it is, it's too crowded for my liking. I mean, I think I have an advantage living there and kind of knowing the, the, use patterns so I can, you know, maneuver around those. That's not something everyone can do. And you can, you can get to a point in that river at certain times of the summer when it's just unpleasantly busy. Um, whether or not that directly impacts, you know, your fishing and your catching, it's hard to say. There's not a one, one-to-one -one relationship there, but, uh, but yeah. So, you know, maybe a little bit of bad press isn't such a bad thing for the Madison because, um, Maybe it will cause a few people to, you know, go elsewhere. I, I was thinking uh, we talked about this on an earlier episode, talking about the back country of Yellowstone, but maybe we can do the problem grizzly reintroduction and release program on the upper Madison, take all those problem bears instead of, you know, taking them deep into the woods, we'll just drop them off at like lion's bridge. And then yeah. it'll spice things up a little bit for the, the average user. What do you think? I, I, I yeah, I could see that. Um, <laughs> It's not out of the question that someone could get mauled by a grizzly on the Upper Madison. I've, and, I've seen uh, them on the Upper Madison. Yeah. They they occasionally find their way down there. Absolutely, they do. And uh, yeah, it, it it might go a long way towards reducing the crowding if someone did. God forbid. I hope it's not. Uh, hope it really doesn't happen. But uh, it, it's it's worth keeping in mind. There's a lot of bears out there. there yeah, that's right. Everybody, pay attention. <laughs> Write that down. Well, I, I'll tell you this right now. We're going to give you the opportunity. OK, after all of these different committees and the discussions and the, you know, the, the regulations that have been uh, amended and, and uh, you know, put on the table, taken off the table right now, Joe Dillschneider's solution to crowding on the Madison. What's what's the answer on this one right here? Gosh, yeah. If I was king, <laughs> um, I, I think it's uh, personally, I think a lot of people who get involved in this and start thinking about it. They sort of knee jerk to um, overthinking it and trying to micromanage. So my theory is right now, the number one issue we're facing is the growth curve. So if you look at it on an X, Y chart, it goes from lower left to upper right. And it's just continuing up. 
Now, if you overlay the fishery fish population over that same chart, you don't yet see a negative impact of the rising use to the fishery. That's the blessing, okay? we I don't think we've reached the tipping point where the pressure is harming the fishery. But I do think what we need to do is we got to um, stop the growth curve, you know? Uh, we've got to flatten the curve, so to speak. And so I think that should be the objective of the group is just to come up with a high level cap. So start with commercial, as you mentioned, we're real easy to regulate, just cap use, which that actually was passed into rules. So the use is supposedly, unless the working group undoes this with the help of the commission, uh, the, the commercial use will be capped at the greater of 2019 or 2020. So now we've got to find a way to do the same for the non-commercial. Let that figure out how to do it and then let that just settle for a couple of years and continue to watch the patterns. And then if there's a need for more surgical sort of micro management maneuvers, then maybe we do those. But for now, let's just do that. And and some of the ideas that scare me the most are the people that kind of bypass that and they want to just tell you where to go and when to go and try and spread people out micromanaging. And for me, that there's going to be a lot of unintended consequences to that. And not only that, but probably most significantly, that is just like ripping my heart and soul out and killing the culture of what I love so much, which is, you know, fly fishing. The reason we all love it so much is it's, it's this freedom, this connection, this, this freedom of everything when you're out on the water and this connection with nature and the ability to, to just sort of follow your heart and, stay out late or go where you want and just all that that's what it is to me is that freedom and and the more we meddle with that and and regulate and make more rules you know that that just just chips away at that so yeah it it, it takes something away when you have to like go to an app and make your reservation for yes. your you know freedom time on the water for sure absolutely well it's a challenge um are you optimistic that that they're gonna get this right um <laughs> not not terribly um i have a feeling there's going to be some things where i personally as a guide and outfitter and angler i'm going to have to swallow hard um i do think right now there's more political will if if you will to do something but i think that's also dangerous because the doing nothing is really not an option here so they you know hopefully they don't just punt and 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 do some things that may have unintended consequences so that's what concerns me most, I guess. And I, I recognize it's a really difficult problem. Someone should be really, um, you know, doing a 10 year documentary or writing a book about this because the, the intersection of like sociology and politics and natural resource management is, is unique here. It's, it's amazing. Uh, never, you know, and things have been dealt with like this in the past, but not exactly like this, you know, and it, it has become pretty political. I mean, the governor's office in Montana is very well aware of this issue and what's going on and is is weighing in regularly. Well, and, and I think the the eyes of, of the country, certainly of, of, you know, the world of fishing are upon the Madison and how yeah. this is going to play out and how it's going to be handled. Um, you know, you mentioned rivers in Oregon, Michigan, places like that, you know, the Deschutes, some of these rivers that have gone through um, similar challenges in the past. Um, for some fisheries, it, you know, it, it has helped and it's worked out. Others, it, you know, it, it's impacted the overall experience, no doubt about it. So, you know, for those of us that, that live here, or those that, you know, come from other parts to, to visit and fish the Madison, uh, and for everyone that cares about the river, I think we're all hoping they get it right. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a big issue. Well, you know, the third thing I want to talk about today in our, in our list of, of Madison River issues um, has to do with access. Now, in Montana, one thing that we're all fiercely proud of is the access that we have to our rivers and streams. Um, it is probably the most, well, not probably, it is the most progressive stream access law of any state in the country. Um, we really set the standard for, um, you know, the way anglers think things should be. Um, if it is a navigable river, um, you know, if you can float a log down it, essentially, um, you know, it, it is typically property of the people of Montana. You may, might be able to own property on either side of a river or stream, but you don't own the stream bank. And you certainly have every right to keep people from trespassing on your property. I mean, that's uh, you know, something that very few people would ever argue with uh, anywhere. But, you know, the rivers and, and streams belong to the people of Montana. Um, 
in the past, we've seen some flashpoint areas, um, you know, some of the uh, the bitterroot fisheries over in uh, the kind of the south of Missoula. Uh, the Ruby River for years was a flashpoint on access issues. Lately, a lot of this has shifted to the Madison Valley. Um, and, and, you know, I don't know that the upper Madison is necessarily ground zero for that argument right now, but it's certainly, um, you know, a place that people are keeping an eye on when it comes to uh, access and, and some of these kind of anti-access um, efforts that, that we're seeing. Um, talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, first of all, I, I would just say I agree with you that Montana stream access law is arguably the greatest thing about this state. And um, the Madison, as you mentioned, has tremendous public access. I think on the upper Madison alone, there are 13 or 14 owned or leased public access points that are managed by FWP. So for the wade fishermen or the float fishermen, there's very little problem getting almost anywhere where it became sort of a flashpoint issue is in the in the uh negotiated rulemaking committee's sort of uh tenure there was some efforts or some desire by a few uh stakeholders sort of a narrow special interest group if you will to um limit or remove boat access from Reynolds Pass down to Pine Butte or Lions Bridge <clears throat> in what's known as the Big Bend area of the Upper Madison. And there is a large private subdivision up there. And there's no doubt in my mind that most of the people that own those homes love it as much as anything for their private access to that part of the river, which is wonderful fishing and beautiful and everything. And it doesn't make them feel very warm and fuzzy when they see boats coming down and parking and getting out and waiting or when they walk down to their favorite spot and there's already a boat there. So that's where um, that sort of push came from largely is, is property owners in that part of the valley. If they had eliminated or succeeded in eliminating float access through that part of the river, there are some public easements for foot access on the uh, Olaf Ranch down, up and downstream from $3 Bridge that have been in place for about 20 years now thanks to um, – a number of nonprofits and Hugh Zackheim and the River Network, and, and they were able to purchase some easements. But if they had eliminated the foot access, there's a section of state land right there at the uh, Big Bend, which would have become largely inaccessible by anyone unable to use a boat. And there's sort of a handicap access component to this, too. So, um, th that's a it's not a huge overriding, um, place or 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 specific issue but it's very symbolic issue and so that's where um you know plwa and a number of other people got involved because regardless of how how small or large or significant it may be to the to the greater picture it's it's very symbolic and it's one little step in the wrong direction towards public access so i think that's the that's the main thing other than that um the access remains pretty set in stone in my view on the upper Madison and the lower Madison and uh, is really some of the best you'll find anywhere, which is part of the reason I love it. And I think so many other people love it. It, it belongs to all of us. It's a, it's a national treasure, you know, um, and people all over the world consider it like their special place because of that. Well, and you know, when it comes to the access issue, as you said, it's, you know, it can be one little effort here or it can maybe just impact this one section of a particular river, but these are all chinks in the armor. And right. there are, I think, some some pretty nefarious entities out there that are working and have been working very hard for the last couple of decades to water down and, and some would even advocate to eliminate the stream access law in Montana. And, you know, you give an inch and these guys will take a mile. And, and one of my favorite things about involved Montanans is, is, you know, every two years is when our legislature meets here. And there's always some wingnut that, that, you know, uh, basically introduces some sort of legislation that kind of maybe does an end around or a, a quiet attack on stream access. And when that gets out, they will call for basically a day of action at the Capitol and you will see thousands and thousands of sportsmen and anglers descend upon Helena that basically says, no way. No, we're, we're paying attention and we're not going to let this happen. Montanans are incredibly proud of, of their access to their streams and rivers up here. And, 
You know, there there are elements, however, whether it's, uh, you know, backing certain candidates for the Montana Supreme Court, whether it's, you know, pushing, uh, you know, legislators that they have, you know, kind of in their pockets to to introduce legislation that would whittle this down. I mean, this this is an ongoing effort by a, a small but very well financed group of people that would love to see that stream access law eroded to the point where, you know, they could have their own private rivers up here. I no mean, doubt. there are people hard at work at it. No doubt. We got to, we got to remain vigilant and, and not let that happen. And yeah, I went to one of those rallies, by the way, it was awesome. Um, it was like a cross between like a rock concert and uh, I don't even know what just started. <laughs> it, was, it was so full of energy and tons and tons of people. And the Capitol was full. Yeah. I packed. mean, the rotunda, the stairways, the hallways were so full of, of anglers and sportsmen that cared about this, that I don't, I don't know that, you know, the yeah. Capitol had ever seen anything like that before. Yep. And hopefully, you know, the, the legislators got the message that this is one thing you don't want to mess with. Yeah, let's hope so. Let's hope so because uh, you know, as you said, we got to stay you know really vigilant about this. It's mm-hmm. not going away mm-hmm. for sure. Well, let me ask you a question. I mean, we we talked a little bit about the dam issue and what you know, what uh, is going to transpire from that, and kind of keep an eye on that. We talked about the crowding issues and, and new regulations that may be coming down the the pike on that one. We talked about access issues, um, and again, as I said towards the beginning of the program, I mean, I live here. I'm concerned about this stuff. I pay attention to it and it can still get really confusing. So if you're someone that, you know, maybe you love the Madison, whether you live in Montana or you're out of state and you you enjoy your trip out here every year, what are some resources that that people can utilize to kind of stay up to date on these issues and pay attention? I mean, if you, if you love the Madison and, and, and you want to know what's going on kind of behind the scenes or quietly that could impact things long-term, where can people go to kind of stay up to date on these issues? That's a great question. I don't I don't know that there's one real clearinghouse for, you know, the truth and, and the whole truth and nothing but the truth. There's certainly um, a decent number of, you know, people in the blogosphere out there that have written some intelligent and good things about it. Um, I'd welcome anyone to, to give me a call if you want to hear my two cents on it. Um, but I, I think just try and watch the news on it is really is one of the best things. I think a lot is going to change. There's been a lot said and over the last couple of years, but not a lot done. So you're, you're hearing a lot and you're seeing some opinions and all these things, but not that much has really changed um, in terms of regulations or recreation management yet. There's a lot of changes afoot potentially. So I would say right now is a good time to, to pay attention, to set up a Google alert for Madison River and watch the news flow. I think in the next six to nine months, we will see some some recommendations come from this working group that then have to go to the Fishing Game Commission, a five-member committee appointed by the governor, and they have to vote to pass those into rules. So it is a very clear um, clear process, um, but it's also like sausage making. It's not pretty watching it. Um, so don't get caught up too much in the hearsay and stuff. The rules re- remain basically the way they have as far as use of the river for 20, 30 years or more. And I would add this, the river last year, you know, I, as a shop owner and outfitter, employer of a lot of fishing guides and a guide myself, I still guide a lot. I hear a lot of fishing reports. I probably take more surveys than almost anyone. And last year was excellent. I mean, that river fished well. I know that it's busy at times, but um, a lot of happy, happy clients and a lot of really big fish. So, so the river's still... You know, it's in great shape. It's amazing. And uh, I wouldn't turn your back on it. Um, but yeah, just just keep keep watching the news flow because some things may change and it may alter, you know, how we operate on a day to day basis. But from my view, I don't think that the fishery or the true nature, or the spectacular beauty of it or anything like that is at risk at this point. Well, that's really good to hear. <clears throat> and uh, can't tell you much. I appreciate you coming on and uh, and sharing this with us because I know again there are so many people that care about this river whether you fished it once 25 years ago you know with a family member and you have great memories you know from that that one experience or you're someone that that makes your pilgrimage out here you know every single summer and, and fishes it at the same time every year or you live here and it's you know your home waters and your your backyard river so um, thank you so much for for sharing your insight and your knowledge and your experience with us today um, and, and taking the time to sit down with us 
Yeah, Jim. Thank you. It's an honor to be here with you. And we'll keep paying attention. I, I would encourage people, if you don't, uh, you know, follow uh, Joe's efforts through Madison River Fishing Company and Trout Stalkers. These guys do awesome newsletters when there is kind of a, a political call to action. They do a great job of disseminating this information and putting it out there. So if you don't follow these guys, uh, I, I encourage you to go to their website, sign up and, and keep tracking what they're doing. Uh, so that is it for this episode of Waypoints. Uh, it is the podcast that is dedicated 100% to travel, adventure, and exploration. Be sure to visit yellowdogflyfishing.com to plan and research your next fishing trip. Sign up for newsletters and new podcasts and stay up to date on the latest travel news, developments, and news from the Madison River. Join us for our next episode of Waypoints. And remember, life is short and no one ever regretted a life of adventure. This has been another episode of Waypoints, the podcast of fly fishing travel and adventure angling. Waypoints is produced by Brian Gregson with music provided by the Steep Canyon Rangers. Visit yellowdogflyfishing.com for more destination profiles, travel news, and expert advice, and be sure to join us for our next episode. Thank you.